So what is an IUL? You hear all over social media, people talking about IULs, be your own bank, cash value life insurance, whole life insurance, retirement planning using a life insurance. In today's video, I want to give you a beginner's overview. So this is completely beginner friendly on what an IUL is, how it works, and does it make sense for you? Should you add this to your retirement portfolio? Should this be your only retirement account? Let's take a look. All right, let's jump in here and you see here, what is an IUL? I'm going to use John for this scenario, right? John is a 35 year old healthy standard rating male. He's been seeing all over social media that he should put his funds into an IUL. What is an IUL? An IUL is an indexed universal life insurance contract. So it's with a life insurance company and, and they allow you to accrue cash in this account. And we're going to explain how. So John is going to save a thousand dollars per month. He decided that that's what he wants to save to add to a supplemental retirement account for the future. So he's going to pay a thousand bucks every single month to this insurance company that's going to provide him the IUL contract. This insurance company or that thousand bucks per month is a total of 12,000 bucks per year. There's some very strict stipulations because again, this is a tax favorable account, right? That that is the most he can put into this account every single year. It's 12,000 per fiscal year is the most he could put in. If he puts in more, he will create what is known as a modified endowment contract. And we'll get into that later. But right now he's going to put a thousand bucks per month into this account. A small percentage of those funds, let's say roughly 15% on average, just take that with a grain of salt. Every company, every contract, every design, it's a little bit different. But about 15% of those contributions are going towards associated policy costs, fees, and stuff of that nature. In, in return, the insurance company is going to give John a death benefit, an immediate death benefit of about a quarter million dollars, hypothetically. He's going to get $250,000. God forbid John gets sick, stroke, heart attack, cancer, death, needs long-term care. He has $250,000 that's immediately there. Again, his money paid for it, right? It's part of the policy. It's part of the contracts. This is what allows in the IRS tax codes. This is something that is required in order to set these accounts up. You have to have death benefit. So a portion of the proceeds are going to go over here and his family will be taken care of in the event he passes away. The remaining amount of his funds drop into an account known as an accumulation account. This is an account that is linked to a stock market index, such as the S&P 500, okay? Moody's, uh, or Barclays, excuse me, NASDAQ, Morgan Stanley, uh, something like that. Uh, he's going to be credited on an annual basis, assuming that you have annual index allocations. You could have monthly, you could have annual, you could have two year, but let's just say on average, it's going to be a one year point to point call option. So he's going to get credited on the interest accrued in his account once per year on average, somewhere between six to 8% realistically. So some people are like, Hey, I could get more in stocks or directly in the stock market. That is true, right? There's a, you usually are going to get one to 2% higher directly in the stock market, but in a direct stock market comparison, you're subject to more, you're exposed to market volatility in a cash value life insurance policy, such as an IUL, you're not exposed to market volatility. So when markets go negative, there's going to be a floor with your contract, usually a 0%, maybe a quarter, maybe a 1% floor. So when markets lose 20%, John doesn't actually participate in the losses. He's floored out. His account value doesn't lose any money on the accumulation value in his account. Yes, he still had his associated costs and stuff that did get um, taken out of the contributions, but his overall account value didn't actually lose money. And then over time, what's going to happen, let's just say 30 years from now, this account, on an average 7% return would be projected to be roughly worth 1.02, $1.02 million. Okay. And John has always been able to access money from his uh, accumulation account. There's another account known as a cash value account that John can borrow loans from under very specific tax codes. Loan provisions allow you to take money from these accounts tax free, right? Because loans are non-taxable event. And there's a, a slew of different types of loans, variable fixed, net wash zero loans and stuff like that. Um, and it's very strategic how you take those funds. But 30 years from now at retirement, he would be 65 and he would be sitting on roughly a million dollars in this account to aid in his retirement, right? Supplemental retirement income. So should he also still have additional accounts? Yes. But this is just like the, 
simplest version of how the IUL works, right? You place funds into an insurance company, then split it up into two. A portion of the cost buys you immediate coverage for you and your family to be protected. If you pass away, your family doesn't lose all the assets and the stuff you have. And then the rest goes into your account that only participates in market gains and it doesn't participate in losses. So it's kind of like a bond alternative, right? You get to, you get the upside of five, six, seven, eight percent, right? You get access to the funds tax free and you can use the money anytime you want in your life, assuming the money's there and you can take loans from it, right? It is very important that this is set up correctly because there are problems that could arise in taxable events that could occur if you mess this up. Let's take a look. Um, some things you're probably wondering is this right here, this thousand dollars is in, cause I told you there's a $12,000 limit that was imposed on John because that's what John decided to structure the policy up. So this thousand dollar contribution is this right here directly is reflected because of that death benefit. So under tax code 7702, when John was like, hey, the most I wanna save is a thousand bucks per month. He was required to have a $250,000 death benefit. So let's take a look here. Let's say John wanted to save 500 bucks per month. Let me change this over here. And let's say he wants to save 500 bucks per month. Well, in that scenario, the required death benefit is only going to be roughly $125,000, okay? So what you want to do when we're setting these policies up is we wanna make sure it is maximum funded, minimum death benefit, based off of what you can comfortably save each and every month consistently. You wanna do this for an extended period of time because again, there are associated costs and we wanna compound it in order to do so and compound positively, you have to be sure that you're funding these accounts continuously, okay? So 500 bucks per month, his death benefit is cut in half. If he wants to save 2,000 bucks per month, his death benefit is going to be roughly 500,000. Again, these numbers are totally subjective. I'm just showing you how it works. The more you wanna save, the more death benefit you have to have by law. And the problem is, is if you say you're going to save a thousand, but then you decide that you're only going to put in 100 because you do have flexibility. Okay. There is flexibility because you have a minimum cost that, that is directly associated with that death benefit. But if you're only paying the minimums, you're just buying life insurance. So you want to be able to do whatever you say you're going to do when you structure these policies. And then over the course of time, these accounts, will compound, like we said, and you have access. Usually somewhere around year five, around year five is your break even point, okay? And break even, and it could be anywhere between years four to seven, it's all dependent on the economy, kind of what are the returns been and stuff. You break even though around year five, which means if you would have put in at 12,000 bucks per year, John would have put in $60,000, his liquid cash around year five is probably $60,000. And understand, when we say liquid cash, that is the cash value in his account that he can borrow from and collateralize with his account value. Because when you borrow money, people are like, hey, well, why would I want to borrow a loan from myself? Well, because loans are non-taxable events. And if you could borrow a loan at a net zero cost to you, which means that it costs 0% in interest. So, and the way that works is the insurance company extends Johnny loan. They're like, hey, here's a $60,000 loan because we already have your money. We'll collateralize it in the event you never pay it back. It'll be paid off um, with the, the death benefit that we would have paid out to your family. We'll just deduct the 60 grand that you owe us and we'll pay it back to ourselves and the remainder will pay out to your family. And the reason you take a loan out, John's going to take a loan because the loan's tax free, right? And then there's a different types. Again, we'll get into another video on the types of loans, variable fix and stuff like that. But if he borrows money, he could borrow it throughout his life. So he could grab money like in year five. He's at like a net cost of zero dollars to this, to the account. So he has the death benefit. He has all the money in his account. Should he come take all the money out? No, no, he shouldn't do that. But if he needs to grab a couple thousand bucks, maybe to pay for his kids, um, first car, college, a car breaks down. He wants to go buy an asset. He wants to, um, he needs to put some working capital in his business. He could grab some funds from here at an interest rate. That's usually got a contractual cap of no more than maybe 5%. Um, sometimes you can, and again, you could usually borrow them depending at, at the contract and stuff. Can you borrow at 0%? Yes, possibly, depending on where you're at in your policy, right? Um, but having the ability to borrow at like two, three, four, five percent 
while your money's still compounding because that's called a variable loan your money is uninterrupted and it can still compound why would you not take that chance right especially if you have um direct use case for it so the money's not completely locked up alternatively if your funds are in a 401k or an ira which i'm not saying they're bad but if your funds are in those accounts they're a little bit harder they're illiquid they're a little bit harder to access um just due to the sheer nature that if you're not 59 and a half you can't touch those funds without an early withdrawal fee of 10 percent and then also there there are times obviously there's very um special circumstances in which you can touch those funds but in most cases you can't so again just to recap and an important thing is this has to be structured properly for each individual because if you're saving 500 per month if you're saving a thousand per month if you're saving ten thousand bucks per month it has to be designed with you in mind and what you're going to do how long you're going to fund it are you going to use it for retirement? Are you going to use it to retire a little bit early? Maybe use it for an advanced retirement between ages of 50 and 59 and a half. And then you start grabbing money from your 401k at 59 and a half, right? There's so many different um, variant, uh, variables that could happen there. So if you are interested in really seeing like the numbers, the projections, how this could work for you, if you should add something like this to your retirement portfolio, I urge you to click the link down in the description book a call with me um, directly. I, I, I'll, I'll leave one of my direct links down um, in the description below. Click that link, schedule a call. I'd be happy to sit down, design something for you, explain it, see if it's a good fit for you, kind of look at what your retirement plan is now, and we can just get an overall bigger picture on what your retirement's going to look like in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, in the meantime, if you haven't already, please subscribe, like this video. It helps the channel, and I appreciate you being here. We'll see you in the next video.